Alaska history from the Bering Land Bridge to the Exxon Valdez oil spill. The archives of the University of Alaska is preserving the record of Alaska's past. The archives, or the Alaska and Polar Regions Department, as it's officially called, is located in Rasmussen Library on the campus of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's the most important collection of Alaska material in the world, holding 53,000 volumes, nearly every significant monograph ever published on Alaska. In addition, there are approximately 300,000 photographic images, rare films, thousands of hours of tape recordings, and extensive collections of personal papers, records of businesses, and organizations. The archival staff at Rasmussen Library does more than simply acquire and preserve these historic documents. The hard work is to organize and index the material so that it is easily accessible to researchers. When a collection comes through the door in the archives, the first thing we do is ask a, the question, does this collection have historical value? Collection processing costs money, storage costs money, so we have to first look at a collection and see whether or not it has historical value and whether or not we want to keep it. Unfortunately, we can't keep everything. We have to be somewhat selective. These collections that we get have been sitting in people's basements, in their attics, they may be organized, they may be disorganized, they come to us in boxes and in crates. The collection is first looked at, and if it's in a logical order, nothing is done with it other than making an inventory and putting it on the shelves. However, most of our collections are not in any order. When that happens, an archival technician looks at the collection and decides if there is any order that she can see in it. Things may be grouped into correspondence, photographs, or artifacts. The items are then stored in acid-free containers. They may be in boxes or in folders or in some other kind of preservative materi materials. It's stored on shelves that are in a humidity-controlled environment where the temperature is controlled and where it's in a secure place. The collection will stay there with a rough inventory to guide someone to it until it can be processed at a later date. When processing money is available, a technician will look at the collection and do a much more detailed uh, job of working with it. A finding aid will be produced, which includes a biographical sketch of the collection. This can be of a person, a place, or a thing. A scope and content note will be done. This contains a narrative about what the collection is about. And then a very fine, detailed inventory will be done the Alaska Steam Collection is a very good example of what happens when we get a historically val valuable collection that comes in and then we get money to process it. In the early days of Alaska's development, before long-distance aircraft and before the Alcan Highway was built, Alaska was, for all practical purposes, an island, accessible only by ocean-going steamer. In 1895, when the existence of gold in the Klondike was still only a rumor, the Alaska Steamship Company was incorporated. In March, its 140-foot wood steamship, Wallapa, made its first run up the Inside Passage along the southeast Alaska and British Columbia coasts. In 1897, the steady demand for passage to Alaska turned overnight into a frantic stampede. The steamer Portland had docked in Seattle and unloaded a ton and a half of Klondike gold. Seattle became an instant boom town as suppliers set up shop in the Gateway City and many small independent steamship companies entered the Alaska trade. During this time before the advent of lights and buoys, the pilots relied completely on local knowledge of the waters. They had to contend with uncharted reefs, the second highest tides in the world, rough weather, cold, and tiny ports with poor facilities. While gold helped to get Alaska steam launched, it was copper that kept it in business. In 1906, Eastern industrialists J.P. Morgan and Simon Guggenheim established the Kennecott Copper Company, 
with the railhead at Cordova in Prince William Sound. To transport the ore south, the syndicate acquired and merged the Northwestern Steamship Company and Alaska Steam. The new Alaska Steamship Company's 21 ships brought passenger and freight service to the Alaskan coast from Ketchikan to Kotzebue. Prior to the development of Kennecott, the only major southbound cargo was the highly seasonal salmon pack. These early days were good ones for the Alaska Steamship Company, though maritime unionism grew through the 20s and 30s, bringing rising labor costs and frequent strikes. Then in 1938, the Kennecott Copper Mine closed, and with it went Alaska Steam's only significant year-round revenue. Still, the pre-war years did bring the company income from a substantial military buildup in Alaska. During the war, the Alaska Steam Fleet sailed for the U.S. government's War Shipping Administration. When the ships were returned in 1947, the government allowed shipping companies to use surplus Liberty ships for virtually no cost. Even the insurance was paid by Uncle Sam. But Alaska's governor, Ernest Greening, long an ardent critic of the company's freight rates, opposed government assistance. He charged the program was a sweetheart deal which allowed Alaska Steam to make excessive profits. In fact, Alaska trade was anything but easy money. Few water carriers wanted any part of it, government subsidy or not. When U.S. Maritime Commissioner George Talmadge was asked at a congressional hearing why more companies were not entering the Alaska trade, he said, Sir, I personally asked at least 25 steamship companies if they could possibly be induced to enter the Alaska trade. Replies range from a horse laugh to nuts. That generally is considered one of the least desirable trades anyone would want to be in. Six months after government support was cut off, every single pre-war operator except Alaska Steam pulled out of the Alaska run. Besides battling Ernest Greening and the indictments and investigations he helped instigate, the company had troubles on the home front. Nearly every year into the 1950s brought strikes by one or another of the dozen unions vying to represent Pacific Coast mariners. But the Skinner Eddy Corporation, which purchased Alaska Steam from the Guggenheim Syndicate in 1944, strove to improve service and cut costs. Alaska Steam became one of the first commercial fleets to become fully equipped with radar. The company invested in easier cargo handling facilities and led the industry in the use of unitized cargo containers. Later, the company pioneered the use of computers to generate billing statements and management data. In the 1960s, Alaska Steam made an effort to modernize, introducing a profitable train ship which could carry 56 rail cars, but the rest of the fleet consisted of aging and slow Liberty ships. Competition came from tug and barge operators who moved equivalent freight twice as fast with a fifth the crew. In 1971, after 76 years as a major figure in the development of the Pacific Northwest, the Alaska Steamship Company went out of business. Had Skinner quit serving the other areas and concentrated his efforts into the rail belt, uh, he would have certainly derived a much better profit and uh, who knows, he might still have been in business, but uh, he didn't feel that way. Jack Dillon worked for Alaska Steam and other lines on the Alaska run on and off since he was 13 years old. He didn't just stick to the one area where the big dollars were. He, he continued to serve the whole territory, the whole state. Over the years, Dillon saved documents and photographs and other records of Alaska Steam's history. I hated to see the year-end reports just thrown into the fire or something, I would save them and take them home without any real purpose in mind at that time as to where they might wind up. But as, uh, as time went on, I began to feel that uh, some of these things were worth saving and would find a home somewhere and be useful 
in the future to people who wanted to do a little research, a little digging into the past history of the things I had been involved in. Jeff Dillon donated his collection of Alaska Steamship Company materials to the University of Alaska, and with financial help from the Skinner Corporation, the collection has been organized and a finding aid produced. These accumulations don't just uh, happen to get processed. Uh, there's an awful lot of work uh, in sorting and cataloging and preserving, and uh, uh, these are functions that are being performed by, for instance, here at the University of Alaska and uh, other repositories, but uh, they're not necessarily falling within the normal functions or funding and that, that help is needed. We're very fortunate to have somebody like Jack Dillon collect records uh, as time goes by at a, at a business company because most people in the day-to-day -day course of activities don't have the time or the foresight to see the historical value of the materials that they create. But we're always creating history all around us and we're very lucky to have somebody like Jack who sees that. Now, the second step that's important is that the records get to a professional library or an archive where the archivists can process the collection and really make it useful and valuable to historians. Um, there's a tremendous depth and broad diversity in this collection, the 27 feet of records that Jack has uh, donated to the library. Um, includes things like ship's manifests, blueprints of the ships, um, menus, little newsletters like even this one right here uh, from 19, July 1934, which was a newsletter issued on board the ship um, containing all the, the news of the day from Adolf Hitler and the winner of the Belmont Stakes and all kinds of things. Um, just little ephemeral like that, which is extremely valuable for a social history of the period, but also is uh, significant in giving us an insight into the way Alaska steam worked since it was the main line to Alaska and the uh, you know has their old slogan was when you think Alaska think Alaska Steamship Company and much of that is represented in the collection. Archivists might not always agree about which materials should be preserved. Historians might not always agree about which has the greatest value but there seems to be agreement that the work is important and that we must try to save a record of our past. Without an ability to, to look back and see what has happened in the past, uh, we don't have a very firm foundation for the future. <laughs>